Haleakala. That is the name of the volcano on the island of Maui that I got to see a few weeks ago. Haleakala. My husband Chris and I were invited to a conference of the American College of Chess Physicians. I got to be a good wife. It was a terrible sacrifice. <laughs> but before and after the conference, Chris did a great job planning our trip. And so right after we arrived, we had to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, but it was okay because it was 8 o'clock in the morning Florida time. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, a bus picked us up. And we drove through the darkness up these windy, windy roads along with all these tourists from all over the world and parked on the top of Haleakala to watch the sunrise. Now they told us that it was going to be very cold, but it was Hawaii. So I thought, I'll wear some pants and a long sleeve shirt, and that'll be fine. That wasn't fine. <laughs> but the bus driver seemed to know that most tourists are idiots. <laughs> and he had all these thermal blankets in the back of the, of the bus that could be zipped up, so he wrapped us all up like burritos. <laughs> and we all stood there with this iron fence on the edge of the volcano looking out into the darkness. It was so beautiful with the stars. I tried to film a devotion, but Nancy rejected it. She said it was too dark. So there we are, Chris and I, straining into the darkness, waiting for the light. And it begins slowly with just some beautiful color, deep oranges and pinks slowly appear on the eastern horizon. And it seems to take forever as they gradually grow. But then all of a sudden, there's this piercing light that begins, this brightness that just starts all of a sudden. And I heard Chris mutter, let there be light. And I said, this is it. And a Hawaiian ranger starts singing this Hawaiian song that they sing when the sun rises and all of a sudden the, this dazzling light appears and it's so bright that I have to shield my eyes with my hand. You know how you do that? We make an automatic visor, don't we? We filter the light and it's coming up and we're hearing this guy sing and it's just beautiful. And then the tour guide says, okay, let's all go to the gift shop. And I think, why now? Which, and we go in and he says, I always encourage people to go to the gift shop because they look right at the sun and it hurts their eyes. It's too bright. The ancients believed that God was up. So they always went on top of mountains to encounter God. Moses went up the mountain. Elijah went up the mountain. Jesus went up the mountain. Because if you wanted to talk to God, you went up a mountain. 27 or 8 years ago, I slept on the top of Mount Sinai. It was really uncomfortable, but I was young. And I watched the sunrise there as well. The same dazzling light, but a totally different landscape. Instead of volcanoes and ocean, as far as the eye could see, this time it was the Sinai Desert and rock. You see, the Sinai Desert is not sand, it's rock. And it looks like you're on the moon. Moses had witnessed this golden calf being made and the people messing up again and he goes back up the mountain and he says to God really the ultimate request the request I think that in our heart of hearts we all have Moses says to God I want to see you I want to see your face I 
want to see God's face. Do you? But God says to Moses, you cannot see my face. I am too bright. You will die. If you look at my face, you will die. But I'll tell you what, I'll put my hand over you. I'll put you in the cleft of a rock, because there are lots of rocks around, and I'll put my hand over you, and I will pass by, but I'll filter the light with my hand. I'll shield you from my brightness. And then once I've passed by, I'll take my hand away, and you can see my back. I had a Hebrew professor in seminary. He felt that the better translation was, you will be able to see where I just was. So Moses is shielded from this doxa in Hebrew, this glory, this brightness, this presence of the divine that is so great that he would probably explode if he had seen it face to face. And he's shielded and The light is filtered as he waits and God passes by because God is too bright. My godfather died when I was in my early 20s of colon cancer and I always wished that he could have lived a lot longer. He was a remarkable man. He got his PhD in world religions from Columbia University in New York City. He studied prayer with Greek Orthodox monks on Mount Athos in Greece. He studied Hasidic Judaism in Israel with rabbis. He studied mystical Islam with sheikhs. He went to India and practiced meditation with Hindus and Buddhists. This week I was sitting in my study and I looked up and I saw a book that he had written and published long ago that I hadn't read in years and it's called Coming Home. Home is our theme for this season so I picked it off the shelf and opened it up he begins by asking us to picture that we're in a church just like this one a church with beautiful stained glass windows and the light is shining through the windows And my godfather explains that the religions of the world are like filters. They're ways of understanding God's light. Just like the light shines through the colors of our stained glass windows and tells us a story. Religions are like filters so that we can understand what is incomprehensible. They filter the light. Just like language Language is a filter of meaning. When we want to convey meaning, we have to choose words, right? And we have to pick the best ones and send it over to the person that we're trying to speak to. And of course, Jesus, the word of God, was the ultimate filter. God was saying, my people are not understanding me. I don't, I'm not angry all the time. I, I need to convey my love. I'll become a person so that people can understand how much I love them. I will filter my divine self through a human body. I love how when Jesus, when people ask him weird questions like the Pharisees today, you know, they say, should we pay our taxes or not? Ugh. And Jesus gives these incredible mind-boggling answers that have all these levels of meaning. He says, Give to the emperor what belongs to the emperor and, what belo- and to God what belongs to God. So pay your taxes if you want, but everything is God's, right? Everything belongs to God, not to us. We're temporary creatures. 
you want to hold on to a piece of land, well, your hand is going to disintegrate in a hundred years. Sorry to be morbid, but it's true. We're dust. You really think we can hold on to anything? Everything belongs to God. And if we don't learn that lesson, our cycle of violence and possession and violence and possession is going to continue and spiral out of control. We've got to learn how we as a human race are limited in our perception, in our understanding. We have to learn to respect and honor other cultures. And most of all, we have to understand that we don't really own anything. We just take care of it for a while. That's why Jesus is always asking us to give, to practice giving it away because it was never ours in the first place. St. Paul says that we are in labor pains, and I hope that's true. I hope that all the struggle and violence of this time is a real birthing, a birthing of a new consciousness where we begin to understand who we are in relationship to the Holy One and how little we really know and how much everything has to be filtered for us to see and understand. Now we see through a glass dimly, St. Paul once wrote, but then we will see face to face. Amen.